welcome to episode 402 of the Yellow Wild Pods. I'm your host Stefan Butzko and today we will talk about Boris Dortmund's 3-2 defeat to Bayern Munich and all the ensuing drama. For all that and more, joins me Josh from JJD TV. I'm uh, very excited to have you here and I know a lot of Borussia Dortmund fans uh, already know you, follow you, but nevertheless, Josh, it's uh, good to have you finally on. Uh, I was already on your show. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I always love your intro, man. It just it gets me going, gets me fired right up. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, man. I uh, appreciate you inviting me on. And I feel like you, you brought me on for what has to be a very interesting episode. We talked to it a little bit before, but I feel like uh, I feel like it's going to be a good one and a little bit of a ranty one. Yeah, yeah, that, that for sure. I don't really even know where to start, to be honest. But uh, in the meantime, uh, before anything else, uh, we have a sponsor for this particular episode. Wir sind komplett schuldenfrei. Wir zahlen keinen einzigen Euro an Zinsen. And this episode is sponsored by the Borussia Dortmund Fan Club London Podcast for the BVB perspective from the island. That can be found at macfagent.podbean.com. And I think they have some new content up, so go check that out. So uh, with that out of the way, Josh, um, <laughs> it is time to dive into a very dramatic match, which uh, obviously started... Uh, with Dortmund uh, taking the lead, but Bayern responding and taking the lead themselves before halftime. Then Dortmund once again equalized in the form of Erling Haaland uh, right after halftime, but Dortmund's hearts were broken once uh, referee Felix Zweier <laughs> went to the VAR station and uh, looked at a handball by Mats Hummels, called a penalty, Lewandowski, yeah, synced it and uh, yeah, so... Now in the table, Bayern are four points ahead of Dortmund. And uh, <laughs> there's a lot of discontent from the Dortmund camp, I can tell you that much. So, Josh, um, I think it's fair to start chronologically and uh, maybe even with the lineup sheet. Uh, so I'll just ask you straight away when uh, Dortmund uh, brought out the lineup or the lineups were published in general, uh, what were your initial thoughts of uh what kind of team Dortmund were fielding and uh, whether that made you feel good or feel bad? I, I think I was relatively neutral when I saw the lineup because I don't think it was a, a bad lineup whatsoever. I thought it was a different system that we were used to seeing, which was a little interesting because it's, it's kind of kind of ballsy to go with a kind of different personnel, different system going up against a match like Bayern. So that kind of took me like by surprise. I kind of had a feeling that it would have been a 4-2-3-1 with, with Mollen and Brandt on the left and right attacking mid, Royce at Cam, Holland up front. But knowing that, because I didn't know exactly, I don't think anyone really knew exactly how long Mullen or Holland was going to play for, that we knew more than likely Mullen would be his substitute eventually. So it, it it was an interesting one. It gave me flashbacks of how Enteresic used to line up. And I was just kind of hoping that that midfield battle would be an area where we exploit, knowing that Kimmich wasn't playing for Bayern, Talisa was in there, maybe not a fully fit Goretzka. I thought that three-man midfield could have been an interesting battle with obviously Royce and, and Brandt floating above them. So I guess I was relatively happy, with, but with a little little cause for concern, just because it's not a system we play regularly. Right. So I I think the the best news is that obviously Guerrero was back in the starting lineup. You had Akanji there, who was doubtful throughout the entire week because he didn't really train until the final team training. Then you had uh, Chan as the holding midfielder in there, and uh, then Bellingham and Julian Brandt as the so-called number eights, and then uh, of course you had. Uh, Dahoud in there as well, um, and then Royce and Haaland more up top. If you want to see it in a in a more of a diamond shape formation, but it often was also four three three, where Dahoud was more uh, as a central midfielder, and then Brandt was further ahead, and Royce was a number ten, and I don't know. So so a lot of lot of <laughs> things shifted and changed, and uh, I I think it's it's really hard to to say who played in what position especially in the first 10 minutes because it was such a frantic game and uh you know if we talk about individual mistakes and i think we're going to rightfully lambast Mats Hummels but the first mistake that was made was actually made by Manuel Neuer and um, because i think in the second minute or so he played the ball straight to Jude Billingham and he couldn't quite uh, pounce it because i think he tried to directly shoot it on target and just didn't hit the ball right. But, uh, you know, just imagine he did. And then uh, a lot more talk would be about uh, what a screw up uh, Manuel Neuer is. Um, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, like, ease the narrative here that individual <laughs> yeah. mistakes were very much uh, made on, on both sides. And, uh, you know, the, the, the second situation that Dortmund had 
was like one minute later where Haaland uh, made a nice run where uh, he was played in by Royce. I think he the, the run started uh, from uh, before the halfway line and then uh, Neuer just intercepts the ball. But there was, you know, you could already sense that uh, things were possible for Dortmund. And of course, uh, in the fifth minute, Dortmund score with this beautiful goal by Julian Brandt. And uh, if we talk about individual mistakes, uh, <laughs> Alfonso Davis not tracking the run of uh, Brandt there is just criminal. So, um, Josh, I'll, I'll give this one to you now because um, the first goal was obviously super exciting, but uh, not only that, but uh, it was by Julian Brandt, someone who we've criticized a lot uh, over the last months here, and uh, I think he showed his uh, quality really well right there. Yeah, I was. I mean, I, I, I every time, it seems like every player I criticize or say like maybe the future <laughs> isn't at Dortmund turns around. Like I did it to Dahoud very early on in my channel, and, and he's become a, a, one of my favorite players to watch. I know this season hasn't been to perfection. Uh, I, I was very critical of Brand because I just really didn't see him sit, fitting into the side with a young Geo as well as Royce. He had to adapt his game. He had to be able to play in different systems. And starting this game off, like I said, I, I thought it was going to be that 4-3-2-1 sort of system. But I kind of thought it got played in a 4-2-3-1 with Bellingham sort of taking that advantage up on the on the, on the left-hand side. Brand and Royce playing together, Brand a little bit more on the right. And Brand's been really influential because he had to be because we have so many injuries that he was regardless of whether you thought Brand was on form or not, he had to play. We just had no other options. And he's absolutely taken his game to another level. Uh, I thought when we could talk about it later when he actually went out of the match, that things kind of changed a little bit. But early on, it was good to see. It was a really composed finish. Davies got outdone, calm, composed, and then with a beautiful finish over one of the best keepers around. And and it was exciting, and it's exactly what you want. Five minutes in at home, and and a player that who's taking criticism from not just us, but from a lot of different people, showing what, what he can do when he's at his best. Yeah, I, I, I'm I super excited about this because I think this was probably the best Brandt move since his goal against Leverkusen. And, um, you know, I, I think right now he's one of Dortmund's best players. Uh, up until the concussion, you could you could see how influential he was uh, also in the, in the game against Wolfsburg, especially in the second half. He showed so much hustle. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to see him in a really good form because... Um, I think for both of us, this, this was always going to be a make or break season for Brandt. And uh, right now he's more in the make column than in the break column. And I think that's very important considering that Dortmund have really high hopes for him. And, uh, you know, to me personally, it's also very important because I was very early in that Julian Brandt hype. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's just a very likable, but very likable player. So um, it's, it's, it's good to see that sort of... Uh, Play and especially against Bayern because um, Julian Brandt is a player, um, you know, who was always, you know, uh, said to be not as good defensively. But I thought even in in that department now he is he is added to his game and that's obviously very important. So um, that all being said, um, what do you think changed then in the ensuing five minutes where Dortmund uh, <laughs> then unfortunately lost the uh, the league lead, if you will, in the flesh table? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's Hummels, and it's hard to point the finger at anybody else. I mean, I, in, in my opinion, when you look at Bayern, for Dortmund to go against Bayern and win the game, doesn't matter home or away, you have to play a pin-perfect match. You have to be composed. You have to basically have a perfect performance. You can't have individual mistakes that cost you goals. And the start we had, I was just on cloud nine. I couldn't have imagined a couple minutes later, one of the most gifted center, <laughs> central defenders with the ball, technically. We know Hummels can sometimes get burnt with pace and, and sometimes has defensive problems. But with the ball, he's one of the best. And you don't expect something from your, a leader like that and someone who's so technically gifted on it to just gift a, a sloppy pass away. And, and it was directly Matt Hummels' fault. It was, it was what I guess, somewhat well, well read by Muller. And then once the ball goes behind Hummels, he, he's never going to win that foot race. Lewandowski comes in, snakes the ball, puts in the back of the net. And that is the worst way to concede to Bayern because you know how hard it is to get a lead and obviously keep the lead. And sometimes, I mean, if it's a wonderful goal, like the Lewandowski header of a couple of seasons ago or, or last season, wherever that one is, that's different. That's quality. This was a mistake and it just kicks you in the gut. And that's exactly how I felt as soon as they, they made it 1-1. Yeah, it, it really sort of took a lot of energy, you know, out of, out of the team. But uh, it, to me, it was interesting that um, the dynamics of the goal, um, how it changed the game or didn't change the game because I thought that 
um, in the entire time between the ninth minute and uh, until Coman finally scored the the second one in the in the second half, which was very late. Um, is that Dortmund weren't really the much worse side? I heard Julian Nagelsmann say after the game that Bayern deserved the win because they were the better team. Um, I don't know how you assess the statement, but I would very much disagree. I don't think that Dortmund necessarily were the much better side, but also don't think they were the worst team. I mean, honestly, if after watching these performances, I'd say Dortmund was the better side. I thought we created more chances. I, I know it's not like we dominated Bayern by any stretch, but I mean, if we didn't have individual mistakes in that match, <laughs> we would have won it. Maybe yes. a couple of refereeing decisions going our ways as well. This was a very, very winnable game for Dortmund. They knew the importance of it. You could leapfrog Bayern to the top of the table, or you could be sitting four points behind. It's a drastically different input, in my opinion, on the rest of the season now. And if you wanted to show that you were title contenders, you had, in my opinion, to win it at the very least, even try to get a draw. We lost it. And and it was, in my opinion, undeserved. And because it was some controversy with the ref led to, I think, a little bit of the blowout, a little bit of frustration from players. But I disagree with, with Nagelsmann. I, I think if you were going to say a side deserved to win, it was it was Dortmund and individual mistakes was the reason we gifted Bayern three points. Yeah, uh, I think this is sort of the main takeaway here from this game. If uh, and and it's a positive wrapped in a negative wrapped in the positive however you want to see it because <laughs> on the one hand the good news is Bayern looked very ordinary in this game right they did not look very uh, defensively organized uh, Haaland had a field day with Upamecano and <laughs> <laughs> you, you know the, you, you could see that Bayern were structurally weak you know uh, against Dortmund's very fast current attacking they had uh, very little to 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 say against and uh, you know Neuer obviously saved their butts a couple of times and I thought that Dortmund in possession um, looked decent because very often games like this that are close it's usually where Bayern are still a very dominant team and Dortmund then ride their luck a bit and need to rely heavily on their goalkeeper but this wasn't it right it was a very even game and uh, you are absolutely right in saying that uh, Dortmund were, uh, it, it was Dortmund's to win or to lose in, in, in that case, because in, in hindsight, uh, with the individual mistakes that were committed, I think you can't get another takeaway. So the, in the positive column, you have Dortmund uh, being good enough to beat Bayern at home uh, when Dortmund themselves are not in the best shape, because we talked about it initially, about the lineup, you know, Guerrero, uh, Jan, uh, you know, you, you name it, or even Haaland, you know, they're all not in their in their rhythm and, uh, you know, the hood also not, not fully uh, there yet. So I think there are a lot of variables which, you know, you, sh you should take positives away from, you know, so Bellingham coming back from injury. Um, it's it, it wasn't quite, to me, um, automatic that Dortmund would play a, a game as well as they did. So I was really happy with that. Um and if you if you subtract the individual mistakes that were committed, I think Dortmund fans can be super happy with uh, a the development of of Dortmund and how well they looked and how much they brought the fight to Bayern, and b how beatable an ordinary Bayern looked. Obviously, the season is long and Bayern can you know improve drastically because they have a such higher ceiling. But for the meantime, and if you want to observe it in the in the sense of a title race, I think that's a good takeaway. Now, the negative part is obviously the four-point gap, and I said it before. Um, I don't know if it was here or in some Twitter space or whatnot, but to me, <laughs> if you want to win the championship, you have to beat Bayern twice a season because, you know, if you look at the recent championships and how they went, it's uh, if you subtract six points from Bayern and add them to Dortmund, it's really freaking close in the table. So... um I think I've seen in your videos, Josh, that you've been a little bit more negative about the whole title race narrative. And uh, for a Dortmund fan, it's you know it's always pretty hard to entertain anyway because Bayern have been so dominant. But nevertheless, um, now that you've seen this game and the performances and put them into context, uh, how hopeful are you that uh, you, Dortmund fans can at least dream and hope a little? It's a it's a different question. I mean, it's an interesting question and. Because I'm somewhat a, a realist, I I like to believe when I can picture it. If we would have won this game today, we would have a different or on Saturday, we would have a different narrative. That's a, a huge indication that this team is ready. And the interesting thing with Dortmund this year, and, and we've seen other like players and and staff even touch on, it, is the fact that the play has been 
relatively average, but the points have been there. And I just, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, you need to at least beat Bayern once throughout the season. And now since we lost our home match, going to Bayern in, in April is going to be difficult. But <laughs> yes, I guess maybe I did, uh, I did focus a little bit more on, on the negatives because, you know, heat of the moment. There were, there were good things to take away. Um, and like, like we talked about, Holland's always a threat. I mean, coming back from injury, not being able to go 80 minutes was good to see. Upa Makano, a lot of, Bayern fans in, in the in the uh, my my chat were saying, "Oh, he's having a having a great game against Holland." I'm like, "What, what match are you watching?" I mean, Luka <laughs> kind of was struggling. I mean, Holland just put so much pressure on that back line, uh, and then some other performances. If this if, if these players can stay fit, there is opportunity that they can gel. And if you look at Bayern or if you look at our schedule coming up, there's a lot of winnable games there. And an, another big thing for optimism is even some of the issues going on in the in the Bayern camp. I know that. The, the sponsorship deals, putting some pressure on, on the board. There's there's the COVID situation. So like all that was, I took into the consideration before the match, which is why I put even more pressure on it because things weren't all peaches over at Bayern. There's, there was that one point gap. It's just such a different narrative for the rest of the season. If you're able to get over that psychological hump of now we've lost six competitive matches against Bayern. And it's, it's just, I don't know what I said as a fan base, as players, I just think some, something has to be your psychologically to do it because Matt Hummel's, is playing. He's not like he's coming back from injury and he had a shocker of a game. Someone so experienced, someone you should rely on in these type of matches for the leadership. And it just kind of seemed like it was unwinding throughout the match, even though we did have a successful performance. So again, just trying to go on the, the positive side, look at our schedule coming up. And if we can put a run of results together, we can potentially close in that four point gap. Right. So, yeah, I mean, before uh, the turn of the year, Dortmund will obviously play next in Bochum which is a Revier derby, but, uh, and Bochum are playing well, but it's going to be a very uh, winnable game for Dortmund. Obviously, the home match against Fürth has to be <laughs> three points <laughs> and like 15 goals. And then you, of course, play Typhoon Korkut's Hertha Berlin uh, in Berlin, I think, on a final match day, which can be a very uncomfortable game. But, uh, you know, Dortmund are obviously heav heavily favored there. So that's uh, nine points. And uh, if Dortmund achieved that they finished the, the Hinrunde on 39 points, which is still an amazing result considering all the injuries and the, you know, the, the general not, you know, the, the team not vibing tactically, if you will, because I've never really experienced the Marco Rose flow quite yet. I don't know how you feel about this, but to me, um, I cannot really uh, grasp the tactical concept quite yet. I feel like it's still a lot of... Um, you know, Im improvising, let's say, and uh, a lot of different streaks of this team from different eras are still in there. You can still see some Favre patterns, some Tersic <laughs> stuff, and so on. So, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like depending on how on how much pressure Dortmund are, uh, they just uh, have various different faces and... Uh, yeah, uh, I'm. I'm hoping in the second half of the of the year, Dortmund can improve on that, and you know, arguably they should. And if if we can keep the squads healthy, which is obviously a big if, uh, I'm feeling optimistic about that. But yeah, in the meantime, so let's circle back to the game because um, you know, uh, Kingsley Coman obviously did make it uh, two to one just before halftime. Um, how did you see the goal? I saw the goal as a. I don't. I don't want to say a, a typical what another typical wrong? gut shot. <laughs> in my opinion, there's. Just, if you want to look at things before the play, that's fine. You can. You can always break down something where it could have prevented a goal. But I think Guerrero has to be more experienced, more composed there, not just to bang the ball back. I know that he felt like under a bit of pressure, but watching the goal back, he he could have put the ball in other areas. Instead, he doesn't really concentrate he just takes a swing at it he puts it off a of hummels which falls back it's it's a calamity of of mistakes once again and that that to me that goal is is a little bit on Guerrero. it's it's unlucky yes but there was uh, there was things he could have got done in that situation to to prevent the unfortunate i don't blame hummels hummels didn't know anything of no. it. he just got smacked with the ball um do you yeah, think I, that I, Guerrero I, should have stayed away at all and just let Kobel gather because in the in the moment to me that seemed like the most obvious option I thought I thought so too, but I mean, I, at first, at first instinct, even though he didn't do that, I mean, all I thought, I thought there was an opening for him just to drill it out for a corner, not to put it right back through the middle where there's bodies. That's how I initially saw it, and I was surprised to see how he wrapped his foot a little bit off balanced to just put it right into Hummels, then to fall to Coman, and then not only that, 
Coleman has a lot to do. He takes a wicked deflection off of Royce to somehow bounce over short Guerrero, who, <laughs> who just doesn't have the inches there to, it was, it was so, it was, a, it was just to me, it looked like a goal that was so avoidable as well. And it, everything had to fall into place for that ball to end up back of the net. And of course it did right before halftime to once again, giving us another gut shot. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll be honest. It, it was bad luck because the way Guerrero cleared it, I'm sure he didn't intend it to, to pummel it to Hummels. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and the way it fell for Coman, you know, it's a little lucky, but then again, Bayern are also very good at positioning their players in a way that, uh, you know, if a ball deflects somewhere in and around the area that they are ready to pounce because very often, you know, it's uh, almost like... Uh, a handball game where Bayern just uh, clock their opponents around the box and then uh, wait for, <laughs> for these deflections. So it's not exactly um, a new concept to them. And yeah, Coman did very well. Hit the ball like he hits his uh, wife or girlfriend or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, it's 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 very unfortunate um, because it's so frustrating and it's once again self-inflicted, you know, and we will talk obviously about the refereeing calls in a minute, but uh, I'm almost more frustrated with this, to be honest. Obviously, uh, with refereeing calls, there's a, there's a very deep frustration because historically there are so many calls that have gone against Dortmund in that sense and also in that season, and I'll address it in a minute, but uh, I just think this is super unnecessary, um, shooting yourself in the foot, and I think you've hit the nail quite on the head by by really saying that that Dortmund really weren't ready for prime time here. Because if if you think about it, this is a must win game for Dortmund uh, if you want to uh, you know uh, make a statement game as uh, Rosa put it, and uh, you know for the statement to be that two of your most experienced players uh, you know really fumble it. It's it's disheartening, especially because Mats Hummels is such a veteran and you don't really expect much of a learning curve there, even though he's like a year older than me and I'm still learning stuff in my life every day. <laughs> <laughs> but but still, from a fo footballer's perspective, it's just, it's just really rotten luck that this uh, happens. And uh, yeah, obviously you, you have to talk about the lack of focus and concentration because that's just what it is. And uh, being done by that um, is... Yeah, it's frustrating. So, Josh, I've seen some discussions on the internet about, uh, you know, whether Mats Hummels' days are, you know, obviously he is beyond his peak, that's for sure, but uh, whether they are counted uh, in a Dortmund shirt as well. What's your opinion on that? I think I've seen someone tweet, now I've seen the light on Hummels. What, 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 have you seen any lights? <laughs> Well, I mean, if people are just seeing the light on Hummels, in my opinion, that's a that's a very reactionary um, opinion. They saw a poor game and they're like, oh, he's done. He's uh, Matt Hummels is probably my all time favorite center back. I've, I've watched him play pretty much my entire life. I'm obviously quite a few years younger than than he is. So I've, I've got to see him come up through the best. And over the years, you you start seeing his pace slowing down. And, and I don't ever think he was the best out and out defender regardless. But what he does bring is unbelievable knowledge. I think he's a very gifted and very high footballing IQ. And I think he's very good with the ball at his feet. And I think he is a leader. That's something that he's been good at. And when, when Matt Hummels starts losing those areas of his game, then I think there's cause for concern because I, I've always been scared with his pace. I always felt his best position was in a back three with two somewhat speedy center backs beside him to allow him to step out into space, to pick out those passes, to play his strengths. I don't always think a, a back four is necessarily made for him but I need to be able to believe that I can rely on him with the ball at his feet. And when I can't rely with Hummels anymore with the ball at his feet, maybe it's lack of concentration, lack of sharpness, then there's cause for concern. So I wouldn't say just over this one single game, Hummels is done, but I think there's a strong need to take a look at the center back position at the end of this season, potentially in January. I don't know what the money situation is. I keep telling people, let's sign Lacroix, let's sign this person, let's sign that person. The money's <laughs> not there. At the end of this season, I think they should address it because Hummels, in my opinion, has been a liability for the majority of this season. This is this game just really highlighted a lot of it to me. And it's because the areas that I thought he was going to be successful in, he's starting to slip up a little bit. And that, that for me, that's cause for concern. Yeah, so obviously, I don't know if you've seen this tweet because this guy is very low-key, but uh, one of Dortmund's medical staff asked someone else on Twitter, some other doctor or what physician, I don't know, 
how to treat chronic uh, patellar tendon disease, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and obviously that must have been in regards to Hummels. So, um, you know, it's a chronic issue. It's probably not never really going to go away. And, it, um, you know, we must not forget that Hummels also uh, played at the Euros and he is... He is in dire need of a vacation and he's not getting it really because the winter break isn't really one because of the whole Qatar World Cup. So um, it, it, it's a difficult one for me personally because I also really like Mats Hummels, but at the same time um, you see a bit of a decline. But um, it, it, in a vacuum you can say, uh, well, maybe his Dortmund days are coming to an end, but then he is still delivering a lot of world-class performances. Um and even if he has slip up, slips up slip ups in one game, um, in the same game he still has a lot of really good moments as well. So let's not forget that, which are usually you know on a, on a much higher level that any other centre back that Dortmund probably could afford can deliver. So um, I I'm still to to me it's still a bit early to to sing sort of the the final songs on on the Hummel's dance, but uh, yeah, it's. It's a worrying uh, game, but I mean, Guerrero, who is, uh, you know, he's not in his 30s yet, as far as I know. Um, he's obviously also uh, touch and go with injuries and not really in rhythm. And uh, you see what happens with the worst left back when he's not in rhythm, like Schulz did uh, at the sporting game. Um, so I can, I can almost, well, I don't want to excuse these mistakes, but I can see how they happen. Especially uh, when Bayern make you run this much, obviously not in the ninth minute. Uh, Hummels still pr should have been fresh there, but uh, uh, just <laughs> before halftime, I can see how, especially to Guerrero, this happens. So yeah, very unfortunate. Uh, own feet very much shot there, <laughs> and uh, uh, then we move on to the second half. And you know, when you look at the end of the the second half, you could really see the the energy levels drop from Dortmund, right? And I was wondering, well, now that, uh, you know, half these guys just came back from injury and it's nice that they're in the starting 11, but how long is this going to last? And then Dortmund come out of the dressing room and I would, I want to say dominate the game until the 70th minute, just until Brandt's injury. And of course you have this fantastic goal by Haaland and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just want to hear your thoughts on, on the second period and this, especially the goal and what it did to the game. I, yeah, I thought we came out like re relatively average for a little bit and grew our way into the game, a little bit of confidence. And as soon as we scored the goal, which in my opinion, it, not that it came out of nothing, but it's not like we, it was coming. It's not like we were putting constant pressure from the start of the second half. But it, it, a little bit of fortune came our way, a nice little finish from Erling Holland taking with his right, perfectly curled. And then I feel like that en enlightened the team. Like, all right, despite the mistakes of the first half, we're back in it. It's 2-2. And we created more chances. And then there was obviously a bunch of controversy before the, <laughs> the third the third goal for Bayern came in. Holland had a really good opportunity as well, um, where he, I, I believe that that one was the one where he put it just wide of the post, or was that in the first half? Yeah, that was in the, that half, that was a good opportunity as well. Then there was the the handball shout or the the penalty shout as well, which I mean, there's been a whole bunch of debate around that of whether it was offside beforehand. We'll get. I'm assuming, assuming we'll get into that. Because, yeah, I I I have extra <laughs> like put a whole nother segment to this. <laughs> So like the, the chances were coming though. And and for me, yeah, like you said, we we dominated. We absolutely dominated. And it seemed like the chance was gonna go our way. If the next goal was coming, it seemed like it was gonna be a Dortmund goal. And then there was the opportunity where the Bayern weren't even screaming for a handball, but oh wait, let me just go to VAR and make sure that we give it and let Lemdowski score. And then and then obviously with the Brandt injury, which was horrible because he was a big influence on that match, seeing Holland go out for the 80th for for Tigges, we it didn't look like another goal was gonna come. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like pretty much uh, when the substitutions happened, like tickets, tickets on for Haaland and uh, Schultz on for Guerrero, I was like, okay, that's curtains now. But up until then, you know, it was a good game. <laughs> but honestly, I thought that it was to be expected that had Dortmund uh, not wrapped this or sealed this game by the 80th or 70th minute or so, that in all likeliness... Um, they wouldn't really find a way to respond. I, I think Daniel Malen had a couple of shots in, in, in the 10 minutes of stoppage time or whatever it was, but it wasn't really um, like like Dortmund were super threatening. So um, yeah, in, in that case, you really have to say it is what it is and those are the circumstances Dortmund are in and it was never going to be perfect. 
but uh, we we take the the 70 minutes that really were good and um what surprised me is that even when um, Marlon replaced the hood in the 60th minute, and I thought that the hood had an excellent game, but you could see he felt his muscles and he just asked for a substitution. Um, you know that that even with uh, Marlon being in there and the midfield uh, shifting a little bit, that Dortmund, uh, in my view, was uh, still really good, and uh, that's that's a positive because this change could have been a negative, could have had a negative impact, but it didn't. So. Um, you know, and and Marius Wolf coming on for for Brandt also. I I liked his energy and uh, you know the um the the penalty kick. I think I feel like it it kind of killed the game a little bit. And I don't know Every, everything after the Bayern goal to me felt like garbage time. I don't really want to discuss it that much. I don't know how you felt about it. No, no, you're. I mean, you're spot on. Uh, I mean, w- w- after the penalty went against us, it just again, it just like all the good work we did over those seventy minutes and looking like we're the team to likely. That's how you want to decide the game. And then, obviously, like you said, the crazy amount of injuries we've had. I'm not the, not on the medical staff. Clearly, there was a, a time limit set for some of these players. They had to get yanked off. So after that substitution, right. it's like if we scored a goal, it'd have been. A, a, a miracle to see if us coming on. And to be fair, we had a couple half chances, but. All in all, yeah. I mean, it was it was pretty dead. It was, it was pretty frustrating after the uh, that double substitution to see Holland and Guerrero go out. Yeah, I mean, also it was just a very disruptive period because uh, uh, the whole VAR moment took uh, forever. Then uh, Julian Brandt's uh, concussion and and his clash of hats. Um, I think was probably three or four minutes or so because I think he was all called for like a, a, a hot second there. To be honest and. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm just. I'm just hoping he is. Uh, uh, first of all, healthy, and they make sure that uh, when he's cleared for, say, the Bochum game, that uh, he really is cleared and not just, uh, you know, keep your fingers crossed that nothing happens because you have to treat injuries and especially head injuries very seriously. Then uh, the the second thing I thought is I was really surprised that Upamecano, who was already struggling without you know, a really hard blow to his head uh, wasn't taken off. That seemed really reckless to me. And um, yeah, I, I don't know how, how you saw the um, the the shot from Wolf to um, uh, Hernandez's pivot foot, but that looked like an ugly oh. twist, <laughs> right? So yeah. I, I don't, I'm not quite sure how Hernandez even, you know, tried to continue. But uh, once Bayern brought on Zula, I think it was the 74th minute, uh, you know, that helped them to to yeah organize their defense a little bit better um yeah i don't know how you saw this entire period but uh, it it was very disruptive and obviously had Haaland to play for you know at the 80th minute um but uh, yeah 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 no i, I agree i agree with that and, and a lot of people are like well why wouldn't he play the whole the whole 90 if you're gonna like again again i'm not i was like i'm not a medical staff i don't know what the number was my guess was the number was probably he can play 70 minutes but because of all the interruptions they were trying to get it as close as they could and then they eventually said all right we got to pull the trigger there's probably gonna be a lot of because it wasn't like he played 80 of 90 he played 80 of 100 and 100 minutes because there's obviously a lot added on uh the upamakana one was a little surprising too because it was a nasty collision i mean to knock someone out cold upamakana was a much bigger lad than brant is so maybe just didn't affect him as much again I'm, I'm i'm not sure but it it did seem like when it comes to those head injuries he should have probably been looked at a little bit more and then lucas hernandez's uh uh shot block was was horrible maybe cringe because he had a planted foot he got in a very vulnerable area and obviously you yeah, could see him struggling really painful it it did and then i'm surprised again he didn't go immediately off he did not look comfortable coming back on the pitch he sh- in my opinion he probably shouldn't have he obviously tried running it off did not last very long and nicholas Sula came on um, but yeah, it was just so much, to, in my opinion, like you, you said, all that disrupted the game. It, it looked like it was decided from pretty much the pen and I mean, Marco Rosa getting sent off. I've never <laughs> seen, never seen a coach get held back like that. I, I love the energy, but it kind of spoke volumes to what happened on the bench as well as after the game and then sending player players out and like young Jude Bellingham having to to say say what he did which we'll probably get into as well yeah uh it was yeah i don't, I don't know if you want to call it a lack of leadership or a lack of of anything or if you want to just say it, it is what it is because i mean if it was me i know how i am as a person <laughs> i'd be i'd be i'd be the first one saying something similar to jude and i plan on going down with him if he gets any repercussion from this but uh yeah it's, it's just frustrating and and i can understand why they're humans why they act the way that they did and i, I love seeing the passion besides rosa but 
I think he, when he decided to, to go at it, I think he, his in, whole intention was like, I'm getting a red and I'm going out swinging. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to fault him at all for this. I, I think the referee just com- completely lost the plot and uh, it was an emotional game and uh, it's, it's not like there's much coaching to be done at that point anyway <laughs> i feel no. like um you know it was uh, I, i'm probably very wrong here um but uh, yeah i think dortmund really were the better team and uh, i've i think I, i've i've written down a quote here that he said in a, a pre-game um press conference to the besiktas game um and uh, that summed it uh, quite up you know because, uh, you know, but in the second half, he said, and especially between the 2-2 in the 53rd minute and the 70th minute until Julian Brandt went down, we were the dominant team and close to turning the match in our favor. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's really much it. You know, uh, once uh, all the disruption just helped Bayern because uh, it killed Dortmund's flow. And uh, here we are now. Uh, yeah, having to discuss also refereeing decisions because, um, you know... Uh, <laughs> Two days later, it it still very much dominates the headlines, and um, you know, obviously, let, let let's go through the situations because I think the the first one we can talk about um, is the Davies handball in the twenty third minute, um, where uh, Muni is trying to cross the ball in the box, and uh, Davies has like a lunging challenge, and the ball very much hits his fist. Obviously, in the penalty area, um, what what do you make of this call? If you tell me that's a penalty and, and the Hummels one isn't a penalty, it, they, they're the exact same type of th- like if one's a penalty, the other's a penalty. It's as simple as that. Why is are we getting like screamed at and punished when the Bayern fans aren't even looking at it? But you better make sure that VAR brings brings the ref back to take a look and give it, but yet Davies gets away with that. It, it just seems the story of how matches with Bayern go. So many controversial decisions. This one was early on in the match. Could have, And if this is a penalty, it changes the entire outcome. Some of the other decisions that happened later might not have ever happened. The brand, like It, it changes the entire entire match because these situations wouldn't fall into place if that was given a penalty that's not everyone always says like oh, if that penalty is given then then the penalty would ended up 3-3 that's not how it works i mean byron or dortman could have scored that and then ran off with it or they could have turned get turned around that's not the way a match works but it's a deciding factor early on in a match that yeah uh, once it's again a butterfly in my opinion effect and it has a it paints an entirely different picture of a game exactly exactly and yeah it's a big decision that's a missed call in my my opinion well you see i'm struggling with this because to me personally, I don't want to see this one be called. <laughs> you know, because it's just very unlucky. And yes, you block the cross, which leads to a chance. And it is with your hand and you sort of increase the, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of space that your body covers. And you, you can make the argument for a penalty and you can make an argument against the penalty. And of course, the I think the the main contention from Dortmund fans, and maybe I'm wrong here, and others feel differently, but for me personally, is um, the decision making of the refereeing team, what to review and what not to review. That's really the the bug that that bugs me here. And um, when Reus went down in the forty third minute, or when was it? When Royce went down? No, when like Royce, in- that was the fifty third minute, right? Yeah, yeah that, no, I, for, 43rd minute was a different one. That was uh, when Haaland pulled Lewandowski and as they were entering the, the box. And I think that was even reviewed. There was a little, little break there. Um, oh, but, yes. Yeah. But yeah, this this should have been... A, they, they couldn't review it um, because uh, it didn't happen in the penalty area. But uh, uh, ha- had it happened in the penalty area, it would have probably been called a foul. So Bayern were really lucky there. And if we talk about individual mistakes, um, that that would have been one by Robert Lewandowski because Akanji he had the chance he would have been offside, but uh, you know the foul obviously would have happened beforehand or did happen beforehand. So I think that's just one uh, that the referee missed, and it should have been a free kick to Dortmund, but. Uh, you know, the video referee, at least in this instance, and we have to give him credit for this, they, um, you know, said something about it. Um, but yeah, nothing came from this. But then uh, in the f- 53rd minute, I think this is really the, the the scene that makes everyone's blood boil because 
Royce clearly is in front of Hernandez and you can clearly see the extension of the arm of Hernandez. He's pushing Royce to the extent that he's falling over himself and Royce is crossing Hernandez and the feet definitely touch. You could see in the replay that uh, the feet do touch and, um, you know, the statement after the game that it was just uh, pushing uh, at, at the upper body um, is just asinine to me and makes uh, Felix Bayer look very, um, yeah, I, d I don't know, just very weak in, in his analysis. So um, what's your entire take on, on this uh, controversy and, uh, you know, factoring the Haaland offside, no offside thing into this? I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to break it on a, on a deep, deeper level, because in, in my opinion, if you're in this match and as a player, you know how much it means. So when you feel like you're getting ripped off is when the frustration starts to boil. So when earlier on, when you said the, the Lewandowski one, as well as the Davies handball, they weren't even reviewed. They weren't even looked at. It's, it's almost like saying like the players don't know if, if you're well, a player. The second one was reviewed penalty, in fairness. Or yeah. Or sorry. Yeah. That, the Lewandowski one was revealed or was reviewed, right? Yes. Yes, the Davies one wasn't revealed. Uh, a review, which is fair, but that's what re relaxes a player. When you know the right decision, because that's what VAR is about. It's about giving the ref the opportunity to make the right decision. So when you don't take the opportunity to make the right decision and completely ignore the shouts, it builds up frustration. It's like, well, why aren't you doing it for me if you're going to do it for them? And yes, they looked at the Lewandowski one, which, I mean, to my eye, I thought it was outside regardless. It, and you just know the rules. It is kind of what it is. But for the Royce one... It was a clear penalty, and I, I read a lot of reports, and I honestly don't even know what to believe because I've had about 15 different offside views showed to me showing that it was onside, it wasn't offside. So I think they're just playing with it. So I honestly, to this day, I don't really know. If it was offside, it's a shame because, I mean, it's offside. There's nothing we could do about it. If they reviewed it, it had been offside. It wouldn't have been allowed to be given. If it was onside, it's a penalty clear as day. But again, these it, to everyone on the pitch, including myself, it looked like it was a penalty why is the ref not stopping it, taking the time to go review it, and then explaining and calming the situation down? Why does he allow the narrative to go on that it's, I don't think it was a penalty? And Marco Royce obviously felt contact. And then to go on, and then obviously minutes were played after the other handball from Hummels, bring back the play. He takes the opportunity to go to VAR, gives a penalty out of absolutely nothing. And that's where the frustration boils. And that's where it's like you have to be consistent. I'm not, I'm not like you have to figure out a way to be consistent throughout the match. So these kind of situations don't happen. So I, I just think it was very poor officiating um, whether it was, wasn't a pen. It just, you'd need to be consistent. Otherwise you're going to get this type of behavior and frustration out of players. So Josh, are you in the yellow wallpaper club of the Bayern bonus is real? <laughs> <laughs> is, I'm is, not now. <laughs> this is something you subscribe to. Like I very much do because um, I, you know, historically Bayern have just been, uh, you know, been on the better end of refereeing decisions, especially in games against Dortmund so many times. And, uh, you know, obviously I could rant, scream and shout here. Uh, I don't know if I'm <laughs> going to, but what the fuck is the freaking review? I mean, that's, that's so basic. It's a blatant penalty in my view and it's clear and obvious and, the, the statement of a referee does not make sense. He says that, uh, you know, he saw the situation clearly and was just uh, the upper bodies uh, colliding a little bit. And uh, because he, quote unquote, had a long leash in this game, uh, it, you know, the, the pictures didn't show anything else. Yes, they did. They showed something else. There, there was contact at the feet. But regardless, <laughs> I still think if you look at it again, you will realize that even the contact... The, the shove, the extending arm by Hernandez will be enough to award a penalty. And it's a pretty, pretty blatant stonewall penalty in my book. Uh, I don't care how long your freaking leash is, could be from here to fucking Mexico. It's still, <laughs> it's still a penalty. So I'm sorry, Josh. I, I, that, that's really what gets me that, uh, the referee is just very arrogant. I think that's exactly what Haaland said in the end that the, he's so convinced of his own perception that in in the biggest game in Germany, he is he's like taking it on the light shoulder, and I think this is what the fuss is all about. And then you know the next day you're being gaslit by the German FA, which is the <laughs> next part, which really screws my head. You know why uh, 
say and and to, for you for you who don't know um Jochen Dres who used to be a German referee he wrote a column um on dfb.de uh you know and basically like a little PR Q&A and and said yeah well in the end it was offset anyway so the entire discussion is smooth yeah okay that's very nice but first of all when Zweier faced the cameras right after the game the offside call was never mentioned never mentioned you know uh so if it If if they had realized it was offside, okay, uh, then that could have been <laughs> their escape route, and all, the entire discussion would have never flared up. And secondly, um, I don't even know if if they really drew the lines and calibrated the offside <laughs> thing. You know, maybe that's just a statement to save their own butts because uh, the German FA does lie every now and then. So why why should we believe without uh, seeing the evidence ourselves? Um, that there were uh, that that it really was offside. It, it probably was, you know. I'll be honest. I maybe his foot was uh, that half of an inch or whatever offside. But nevertheless, uh, do we really know? No, we don't. And uh, the most annoying part about this is we could have known because we have all the technology, and it would have taken maybe a minute uh, to to check for offside and whether that was a penalty call and that. And in, in real time, uh, VAR could have communicated to every of the 205 countries in the world watching this game, <laughs> <laughs> including you in Canada and me in Philadelphia, uh, where, what, what happened, you know? And then the entire ordeal, plus the Streisand effect and all the uh, other ensuing things we now have with the potential ban for Jude Bellingham or whatnot. All of this would have been cleared up had they just applied the technology correctly. And I've been sitting here and I want to be a proponent of VAR and I don't know how you see it, but I feel like they're not getting it right. And the communication, and especially in real time, is very important. And then to say after the game, oh, well, it was offside anyway the next day, that doesn't help the fans, that does not help the players on the field. So um, do do you think that the VAR and, and how it's conducted, they need to take a very hard look uh, at themselves and how they do it? And do you think that with all the, let's say, shitstorm that's gone off now in Germany, <laughs> that this actually will help? Because, you know, we've talked about historically Dortmund being at a disadvantage. Just think about the 2008 Cup final when Mats Hummel scored a goal for Dortmund and was 40 centimeters off the line, but they, uh, you know, there was no goal line technology then, and that was changed because of that. You know, goal line technology in part was introduced because Mats Hummel scored a goal, uh, which would have won the game, I think, in regular time, but in the end, Bayern came away with it. So, uh, long-winded question short, do you think that uh, <laughs> VAR will improve because of this game? Yeah, I mean, yeah, in, in the, the double-sided question that you asked, in terms of VAR, it, It lost, it lost the plot along with the ref. And like right. you said, and you, you nailed the head on the coffin, it was down to players feeling ripped off throughout the game. You have the opportunity to, to make it amends. Be like, guys, listen, I went to VAR. This is what it's in here for. It was offside. And that way it knows instead of obviously allowing it to go on, which then builds in frustration. And you have to worry about game management because it's, and VAR should use, be used properly all the time. But you have to also take into consideration the atmosphere and the perspective of the match. This is a top of the table tilt. This is a two sides that are enemies against each other, one point beside each other. This game means so much. It's 2-2, and you're not even going to go take a look. You're not going to intertwine. You're not going to calm the nerves. You have a bunch of anxious and angry people that will be on there without an explanation of what's going to go on, and you don't even utilize something that it brought, got brought into the game for a reason. That's poor That's poor management of, of the match, in my opinion, which then allow tempers to build to then... Uh, 20 minutes later to allow the exact same situation where, hey, guess what? I know it didn't look like anything happened, but let's pull the ref to the bar. Let's show them that there was a penalty. Let's give Bayern the penalty and let's ultimately give Bayern the win. Plus sprinkle everything else in there. It builds so much frustrations that it eventually after Marco Rosa gets dragged out, the players are, are furious. <laughs> and I know Jude Bellingham is a very composed, because I've listened to him talk quite a bit. He's a very composed 18-year-old. I know he's still very young. I think he was just around a lot of the conversations. because I, I even tweeted out, I'm like, how many of you guys knew that he had a, a match fixing scandal? And I don't think that it's, and if there's any reason that VAR, and I know it's not a directly link, I think the big negativity was that Jude Bellingham basically called out the ref for match fixing. I, I, and I loved it. And I'm like, this is, it's not like he's screaming something that wasn't true. And I know he was somewhat insinuating maybe that 
he fixed this match because it was just hilarious having the balls to do that. But I think that's the the type of PR that the league and, and doesn't need. They don't want to have that that background in there. So I think if they look back on it, this whole situation came with the fact that, like you said, it could have been avoided. So, yeah. I mean, kudos to Drew Bellingham. If he gets a fine, fantastic. If it's a one-match game, I think he'll live with it. We don't know what the repercussions are going to be. But hey, my man's spitting facts. And <laughs> and if it's cause for concern to use your technology properly, because in my opinion, I mean, maybe Jude shouldn't have said it. Maybe it, it could have easily been avoided, but it could have started to be avoided from the minute that there was a call for a penalty and you could have relaxed everybody. Yeah, so before we talk about the whole Zweier match-fixing thing and Bellingham thing, because that's <laughs> another topic, and uh, yeah, I, I've uh, I've written it down, like, at, at least in, in Cliff Notes, so uh, people can catch, catch up a little bit, but Josh, um, the, the whole Hummels penalty call to me stinks not only because of, uh, you know, previous long leash statements, and, um, you know, the, the the guy who's beefing with Felix Zweier beforehand is Manuel Grefe, who was obviously Germany's best referee until he was forced into retirement. And he said after the game uh, at uh, Aktuelle Sportstudio uh, at ZDF, he said, I can absolutely understand Dortmund's anger. The decisions were made to the detriment of BVB and thus unfortunately decisive for the game. The balance was not right in Zweier's officiating. A top referee has to be more sensible in the top match and a adhere to his own standards for what it's worth the push on Royce is a foul and obviously that was um, also the, the the whole you know adhering to his own standard thing is, is also just to to the decision came down on on that penalty for Mats Hummels because um, if you look at it and you know we all did now um, Hummels is wedged in between two players one was his teammate and one was Thomas Müller you'd see Müller shoving and Hummels not even really seeing the ball come to him at, at, at the point where it hit, hit, hits him because uh, it's much of a tumble. So, Josh, um, what really bugs me is that the referee looked at the same situation eight times. You know, they showed him one perspective uh, on the on-field review and I thought that's also very poor. I feel like this... They, they should be able to come up with more perspectives than eight. And I feel like also when you have to look at it eight times, it's not what you would refer to as a clear and obvious error. So, um, I I mean, I'm I'm biased here and so are you, but I think <laughs> <laughs> that, that this, this, this penalty call um, is, is completely wrong uh, in the context of the game. And uh, I would like your opinion on that. I like that you said in context of the game, because it's, again being putting the bias hat beside it you see these given like and m yeah. more times than not almost every single time when the ref goes to the var like you said gets eight different angles though the longer you're at the var the more you're going to find a way to give it a penalty which then goes to the what, like you said is it a clear and obvious mistake but in my opinion if you allowed one to go earlier like the davies one you didn't even you didn't even look at it that's another big issue of this and I don't know, I'm just torn. In the context of the game, it's unfair to give, considering that there was two massive shouts for penalties that weren't given, and yet the game-deciding goal is decided by a, a a penalty that the Bayern fans weren't even, or the Bayern players weren't even screaming for that happened a little bit later. In the context of the game, it was BS, and it's why the frustration, again, boiled up. But had, potentially, the Davies one been looked at, had the other one been looked at, if everything was being looked at by the VAR, I could have maybe seen it given, which is why, ultimately, it was given. Yeah, yeah. One absolutely frustrating aspect about this whole thing is also it turns like a one percent chance and a seventy-five percent chance. I think <laughs> Tobias Escher said it on Twitter. And if you look at all the other situations, when Royce had the ball in front of Hernandez, uh, he could have crossed the ball and it would have been a much better chance actually. And the Meunier cross also would have been a much higher value chance. So obviously that adds to the frustration you feel. And now I think. We can lastly come to this whole match fixing scandal because it's really a blemish on the German FA. And, you know, this scandal really dates back to 2004. And there was a referee who was called Robert Häuser who fixed several games in that time, uh, which resulted in betting fraud of over 2 million euros. And he took bribes from some Croatian mob figures who operated an establishment in Berlin which was called Cafe King. I think one of the most prominent games that was fixed was a cup match between Paderborn and Hamburg where Hamburg lost uh, because of dubious penalty calls. I think they had a player sent off and uh, 
if I remember correctly, uh, Hamburg fired the coach over this result and uh, later <laughs> the German FA had to pay uh, Hamburg sort of 2 million euros in damages. So now Felix Sweyer was the linesman of Häuser, right? This is where he comes into the entire uh, equation. And, uh, you know, when this whole thing blew up, actually Häuser, uh, you know, when, when, when he was found out, Felix Sweyer was the crown witness against Häuser. And, um, you know, long story short, Häuser was sentenced to two and a half years of prison time and uh, obviously received a lifetime ban from refereeing, as one should. And, uh, yeah, that was a scandal that obviously rocked Germany pretty hard at the time because it was literally one year before the World Cup was to be hosted in Germany. And, uh, yeah, for so for reasons I cannot tell you, Felix Weyer got to continue his refereeing career. But here comes the kicker now. So this one thing happened in 2005 and you think everything is done and dusted. And then in 2014, the newspaper site comes over the report that the German FA also found Zweier guilty of wrongdoing and banned him for six months, but kept it a secret. They covered it up. And so how did they ban him for six months and covered it up, you ask? Well, obviously the entire refereeing team was suspended and they counted his suspension as already served when he was uh, banned for six months. And so that means the, the, the findings uh, in of the Zweier investigation never made it to the public until, of course, the site dropped the bombshell in 2014. And I might add in December of 2014, which is, funnily enough, two months after Felix Zweier was crowned to Germany's referee of the year. Bit awkward, isn't it? So um, here are some excerpts I've translated from that report. Uh, number one is Felix Zweier has behaved in a, quote, grossly unsportsmanlike manner, unquote. Quote, it must be assumed that Felix Weyer did not object to Robert Häuser's first attempt to recruit him in the manner to be expected of an honest reverie and accepted the money. And then Zweier has not reported the match fixing of Robert Häuser known to him to the DFB over a long period of time. So that's also very important that, you know, even though he was the crown witness, he kept it uh, under wraps. And um, then they also write, before the SV Wuppertal versus Werder Bremen Amateur match in 2004, Zweier accepted 300 euros from Häuser to avoid critical situations for Wuppertaler SV as an assistant referee. And that's probably what Jude Bellingham referenced. So about the 300 euros, um, Zweier denies to this day that he actually took the money. But uh, once Häuser was arrested, he... Uh, flipped pretty hard and snitched on pretty much everyone in a 50 mile radius and uh, pretty much everything he said was corro corroborated so we can assume rather safely that uh you know it's why I actually did take the money and uh yeah this is sort of the entire scandal and uh why jude bellingham said this after the game well for me it wasn't you know he's not even looking at the ball and he's fighting to get it and it hits him i don't even think he's looking at the ball but you know, you can look at a lot of the decisions in the game, you know, you give a, a referee that's, you know, match fixed before the biggest game in Germany. What do you expect? Well done. I, I enjoyed the, the background story there. You got, you got, you got deep in it, but um, it, it's, it's insane. And, and there's so many different layers we could look at with this, but I mean, I mean, for me, I asked it on Twitter, how many people you actually, how many people out there actually knew of this scandal and that he was involved Almost no one said, yeah, I, I was aware of this. And if you're going to have decisions like this, it's not like Jude Bellingham came up there and simply said, we lost because he completely fixed it. He didn't go out and say exactly word for word that. But he brought up a past that is public knowledge. Everyone should know of of what happened in 2004 or 5, whenever the match fixing sc scandal went down. And they should know that this ref is unethical. It doesn't matter that it's years later. I know he served his sentence, but your reputation, you're an unethical person. You went through a scandal like this and don't be upset. Don't cry like a baby. Don't prosecute Jude Bellingham because your actions have repercussions. And during shit shows of matches, I just cussed on, uh, <laughs> on, on Saturday. Yeah. Guess what? People are going to throw things back in your face. So, I mean, I'm, I love the fact that Jude Bellingham did it because could you imagine if he didn't, I don't think this would have been going around, but it was obviously boiled up in the locker room. I couldn't imagine what words were being tossed around in the Dortmund locker room after the game. And 18 year old Jude Bellingham is just learning all this. Like, oh, really? And says, yeah, well, what do you think is going to happen when you put someone who's unethical like this in front of a game like this and you get this type of officiating performance? So I personally loved it. I, I, I don't, I really hope that 
Jude doesn't get in trouble, but I have a strong feeling there'll be some repercussions on his side as well. Well, f- first of all, I've we've all said before the game that Felix Weyer nowhere near should be any refereeing whistle. I just don't think if you have this in your past, and this is what uh, Manuel Grefe also did allege at that time, that you know he just shouldn't be a referee, and all the honors and accolades he's received, I think, are uh, just unwar- un- unwarranted just based on his refereeing performance. Because, in all honesty, I just don't think that he's a good referee, and he does not deserve to be a FIFA referee. I just don't think he's at the level. So I'm not entirely sure what the German FA sees in that guy and uh, the fact that they also covered up for him um, is is very daunting. And it's kind of, you know, it, it's it's very nice that Jude Bellingham said the things he said because it spots really light on uh, the, the corruption and uh, all, all that that's going on at the German FA. And um, yeah, so <laughs> what I thought was really funny is that, um, and there were some headlines uh <laughs> Which, uh, I mean, it did make headlines. So Marco Hase is obviously the, the refereeing observer that sits in the stands and, uh, you know, sort of files a report card of what the referee did well and not. And this guy, uh, after hearing uh, the interview, filed a criminal complaint against uh, <laughs> Bellingham and Manuel Grefe. Um, because uh, according to his criminal says criminal offenses are insult, defamation, and slander, and these would also apply according to Hazard to referee Grefe. Without referee Grefe, Bellingham could not make the statement from life experience and cannot have done. Um, which, uh, yeah, obviously this thing is not not going anywhere. It's just uh, a footnote in how how uh, yeah thin skinned they are over there and just goes to show what kind of people work for the German FA and uh, yeah so that's I very mean, gonna... <laughs> that's that's just very annoying but uh, yeah um, in, in term, obviously the German uh, FA are investigating if uh, Jude Bellingham said anything um, that uh, you know could infringe of I don't know the integrity of the sport which uh, at this point sounds very laughable um, your personal opinion do you think they will come down with anything and uh, if if it's anything then more than a monetary fine, meaning a ban uh, for one or more games, do you think that would be justified? Uh, well, I, mean, I think the, the funny thing about defamation is 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 Jude was spitting a fact, so I'm sorry right. there's no defamation there. And he had the uh, backing but, of his club too the next day, where they said yeah. Jude said nothing wrong, should have said it, maybe not. <laughs> I think he should have said it. That's just my opinion. I think he should have said it. I think actually more players should say it. I th- I think the I think the narrative was was a little bit poor from Dortmund. I think someone like maybe hum- Hummels, Chan, Royce, they should have been the ones saying it, not putting an eighteen year old kid on the stand. But I'm I love the way that Jude talks. He wears his heart on his sleeve, and I mean even Holland wears his heart on his sleeve. But Holland said I can't speak anymore because I'm going to say <laughs> something. I'll get in trouble for it. Jude didn't care, and I love it. And I'm I'm that type of person when it comes to wrongdoings as well. But I do think Jude's going to come down because who who suffers the most from this? The German FA. Yeah. They're the ones who covered up covered up for this this. Um, these individuals, because who knows how many they covered up for, and now Jude is putting light on a very sensitive situation that only hurts a German FA. So, how, how are you going to scare players from doing this? You're going to come down on them. It wouldn't surprise me to see Jude getting a hefty fine and a one or two match game suspension, which is completely unjust for sh- talking about the truth, talking with someone that you chose to cover up. So, I think it's going to become an ugly story. I personally do, and I, I have a bad feeling what's going to come for Bellingham because the Jeff, the German FA, are going to have to put a statement down saying. Be careful what you say because we will come after you if you go against us. Right. See, this is this is what's annoying me because obviously Dortmund have suffered enough at the hands of German refereeing, <laughs> and this will be just a, another thing which uh, is semi self inflicted, I would say, because of the things that Drew Bellingham said. But at the same time, um, I completely understand the frustration, and I also think um, if if you are trying to, you know compete in a sport at, at the top level um, you should call into question why this guy is allowed to referee and I think that should be allowed and uh, yeah obviously um, people will say yeah it's funny how this is being brought up now that you've lost and you know you can say well you're but hurt so a loser but uh, in all honesty <laughs> he was <laughs> and we are and uh, I personally am because I think before we end this episode, and I know we're running out of time here, there's one final thing I want to say because why I am a massive rock of salt. 
when it comes to and 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 always uh you know hate on referees and and tweet about the Bayern bonus but so I I think especially in this season there are a couple of situations that really have irked me the first one is obviously the game against Gladbach where Upamecano uh fouled two players in the box within like two minutes and it, I think it was a 1-1 draw and uh Gladbach easily should have been should have been given two penalties and everyone in the media said that these situations should have been reviewed so it's once again Bayern avoiding a, a VAR review when it's absolutely necessary and the second one is in the match against Leipzig where uh, I think Kampel takes a shot and Thomas Müller makes a very weird twirly figure and he blocks the ball with his hand and I think it was maybe it was just on the line or outside of the box I don't know but um Uh, the situation once again wasn't reviewed and it absolutely should have in my opinion especially since uh, like five minutes later Kampel uh, hit the ball with his hand in the box and that was reviewed <laughs> so it's just it's just a double standard that's applied here to Bayern Munich and uh, I, I think it needs to be called out and I think it it has repercussions because the the Bayern game in Gladbach meant that Bayern had one more point than Dortmund in the table I think they would have lost it had Gladbach received the penalty which they absolutely earned or two even and uh, you know obviously you don't know how the Leipzig game goes because Bayern in the end still won 4-1 but uh, you know it still would have been nice for Leipzig to take take go ahead goal and uh, in the same breath when we talk about the uh, Gladbach game is where also Dahoud got sent off because he made a you know a wave with his hand and the referee didn't like it and was a second yellow and afterwards Eitekin I think admitted that um uh yeah that it, it might have been the wrong judgment on his end so you know i'm not even gonna go because we don't have time through all the missed calls for that that went in byron's favor I'm, i'm saving this one for next episode but josh um i i think dortmund have been done really dirty here and i think we needed to highlight that and uh, we've discussed everything else beforehand so um you know obviously um, for the Besiktas game, there's not much left to say. I don't know how many minutes you have left here, but uh, if you don't, um, please tell our listeners uh, where to find you and and your YouTube channel and uh, what the best way to follow that one is. My guess being YouTube. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can find us on YouTube, JDD TV. Um, I'm on Twitter as well. It's usually the best way to chat with me if you if you have any points, and um, it's at TV underscore JDD. But yeah, I mean, every point you're talking about was was spot on. I don't know how many different visuals of different pictures that were posted after the game of all the wrongdoings <laughs> and poor poor calls that happened that Bayern got away with going back to even Dante's tackle on Royce way back in, in a Champions League final. So, I mean, this thing's this is going on for almost a decade now. It's quite ridiculous. I think we were hard done by as well. And we'll have to pick it up the pieces, try to get something together and hopefully go on a roll starting with Besiktas midweek. Yes, yes. So, um, quick... I don't know if you have time, but I'm still going to do it. So a quick rundown of the lineup <laughs> that I assume will happen. And I want to see is hits and goal. Schulz at left back, Pongracic and Zagadou center back, then Paslak right back. Midfield, you have Witzel and Russia, and you have Knauf and Heine in midfield and Tigges and Malen up top. Uh, because I think uh, Rose said that Sean is, he's obviously suspended, but Haaland, da, who Guerrero and uh, and Schulz also like need to be, uh, yeah, uh, need some load management. So... Is this a lineup you would agree on or would you bring a, a stronger lineup with, say, Royce in it and uh, other players in order to uh, make this a W? Um, I could care less. I mean, let's be honest. This game means this game means nothing. We're going to the Europa League. Um, don't there, There's a lot more to play for this season. We've had so many injury problems. Play that. Play that. Start, they're not going to play that starting 11, I don't think. I'd be surprised to see it, it all go like that, but I love it. I mean, yeah, you want to want to go behind the, the bench from Michael Rosa? take a little seat down p p play the game like it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter and make sure our players get back to full health because we need them for the season we need them for the poll call and we'll need them for the europa league when to start back up next year this game doesn't mean anything and give some minutes to some players that will let's see what zaga do and, and some of these players can do to hopefully get back to shape because they need the minutes more than our p p big important players have been battling injury all right then uh lastly a scoreline prediction yeah <laughs> Well, but that's starting 11. <laughs> nil nil is what I'm going to say. No, I think we'll find a way to get it done. I, 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 I'm assuming we'll play a little stronger of 11 than that, some, something of a mix up. 
I'll, I'll say 2 nothing because Besiktas has just been atrocious this season as well. Game doesn't mean anything to them. I think quality will come through. So I'll say 2 nothing Dortmund. All right, I'm going to say 2-1 Dortmund. I think uh, there will be some Champions League memes yet again. <laughs> but, yeah, with that, uh, Josh, once again, thank you very much for coming on and uh, indulging me <laughs> on my rants. And uh, it was nice to hear uh, your takes as well. So, um, yeah, I hope uh, our listeners... Uh, receive your uh, youtube channel and twitch channel if they haven't checked it out yet uh, well you can uh, follow us of course at yellow wall pod on twitter and facebook you can follow me personally at stefan Butzko. if you want to subscribe to this show also do that via youtube itunes stitcher soundcloud spotify etc and if you want to contribute like uh, the Borussia Dortmund london podcast uh, then uh, go to patreon.com slash the yellow wall that should be all from us for today we will be back with a preview of the Bochum game and there will be further rants as uh, promised from Lars Pormann and maybe even Matthias. Who knows? Uh, in the meantime and until then, uh, be safe everyone and goodbye.